Welcome everyone to our Bunky Clinic virtual visiting professor series. Um, I am uh, Bob Aksafa and along with my partners, Greg Bunky, Rudy Buntik, uh, Andrew Watt and Walter Lin, I'd like to welcome you. And this afternoon, for us at least, um, morning Taiwan time, uh, we have the distinct um, pleasure and, and honor to welcome our good friend and colleague, Professor Mingwei Cheng from Changong Memorial Hospital. Professor Cheng really needs no introduction, um, but I will go ahead and uh, attempt one. Uh, just by way of background, for those who are not familiar, Dr. Cheng performed uh, his residency or completed his residency at the Changong Memorial Hospital, followed by a fellowship in the U.S. in Houston at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, initially, his main area of clinical focus was in the head and neck, but eventually he um, moved on to breast reconstruction as well. Um, and as well, uh, as, as we all know, lymph lymphedema too. Um, he has uh, authored over 230 peer-reviewed papers. Uh, this is probably an older number. I'm sure it's even more by now. Uh, 41 book chapters and two textbooks, one in lymphedema and one on head and neck recon reconstruction. He's trained over a thousand international fellows. I mean, it's an incredible number. And obviously, Changgung, as we know, is a... Uh, um, is a destination for international fellows um, uh, because of the volume and complexity of the, of the microsurgery program. Um, he's been a member of ASRM since 2003 and has made many contributions. He was the ASRM Godina Fellow in 2006, and he was the ASRM Zamboni Visiting Professor, pardon the misspelling, in 2016. Uh, he holds 20 national patents in Taiwan, three patents in the U.S. He held the first uh, World Symposium on Lymphedema Surgery um, in 2013, um, 2016, and 2019. Uh, and then he also held um, the uh, first Asian Symposium for Breast Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery in 2009. On a personal level, um, uh, us at the Bunky Clinic and Professor Cheng have had a long collaboration for the past few years, uh, which began when he visited us as a visiting professor about, I believe, three or four years ago. Um, and here he is uh, also giving us a talk uh, on lymphedema. Um, he then was kind enough to host me at Changgung um, about a uh, couple of months after that, um, where I was invited and lectured on um, both replantation as well as phall phalloplasty. And I was able to actually scrub in, and he um, basically showed me the nuances of the submental flap um, harvest, and, and I saw um, his expertise firsthand, and I was able to also learn how he ran his lymphedema clinic um, along with his staff. I was fortunate enough to travel back to Changgung last year um, with two of my partners. You see Dr. Mang Chen on, on the left here and also Dr. Walter Lin back here. And during this trip, we actually had the uh, privilege of doing another operation. In this case, we did a phalloplasty. You can see Dr. Chen operating um, here um, doing the vaginectomy and the urethral lengthening. And then I had the privilege of operating with Professor Cheng, and this was um, a lot of fun and truly an honor. Um, and this is actually the, the case that uh, Professor Cheng has just written up, um, where we did the uh, world's first, as far as we know, immediate uh, lymphatic or venous bypass um, in a radio foreign phalloplasty harvest. So I'm on the right here with Professor with Dr. Jamie Hung uh, doing the mi microsurgery, and here's Professor Cheng and Walter uh, doing the immediate LVA on the on, on the hand. So. Uh, it was a great trip for all of us, for both us and um, uh, um, uh, from a collaborative standpoint for uh, P Professor Cheng as well. Um, again, Mingwei, thank you so much for being with us today. I know it's a Saturday morning and it's quite early, so we definitely ap appreciate that and we uh, value your wisdom and your expertise. I'm going to go ahead and give you uh, control of the screen here. Give me one second. There we are. Thank you so much, Babak. Good morning, Dr. Banki and everyone. It's my great honor and privilege to share my experience and return to Banki Clinic as a visiting professor. And actually, I'm now is an adjunct faculty at Banki Clinic now. Yes. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So, I think uh, um, this is a disclosure. So today my topic is lymphedema microsurgery. And um, it's my great honor to visit Bunky Clinic at 
uh, February 2018, I enjoyed the trip uh, uh, and also the great hospitality at a banking clinic in, in San Francisco. And I, I gave a talk uh, at that time uh, for lymphedema uh, surgery. So today I will briefly uh, cover up uh, some basic concept for the upper limb lymphedema. And also I would like to add uh, something new at Tango Memorial Hospital right now. We are doing for lymphatic um, so microsurgery. Ming Wei, uh, is there any way you can, um, is there any way you could display your screen in full screen mode? Okay, full screen, okay. Is that okay? Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's perfect. Thank you. Um, and first part is a vascular lymph node transfer for upper limb lymphedema. Excuse me, how can I close my? Can I control my my? Yep. Um, here you can see there's a, a different grade. And after um, a couple of years of experience, I use uh, um, not only just an objective uh, uh, symptom to the to grading the patient, but also subjective um, measurement, such as a uh, circumferential difference. If a greater than 10 to 19 percent, there's a grade one. 20 to 29 percent, grade two. 30 to 39 percent, grade three, and more than 30, 40 percent, grade four. We also use a lymphatography to to diagnose the severity of the lymphatic obstruction and divide into a partial obstruction and total obstruction. In partial obstruction, we can advise patients to receive rehabilitation, complete deconstructed therapy, CDT, or lymphomenous anastomosis. If a patient has a total obstruction on lymphatography, we will suggest to use a vascularized lymph node transfer to treat the lymphedema. If more than severe uh, than grade four, we probably need ad additional procedure or even charge procedure uh, in addition to vascularized lymph node transfer. So the indication for vascularized lymph node transfer include trans lymphedema late grade two, three, and four, and total obstruction on lymphagetography. If a patient has partial obstruction on lymphatography and, and without patent lymphatic vessel, uh, endocytic green lymphography are also indicated for vascularized lymph node transfer. Patient may have repeat episode of cellulitis or fail to CDT for six months are also indicated. And the contraindication include recurrence or metastasis. Here is an example of the, the total traction on right upper limb lymphedema. As you can see, no uh, plasma acetal lymph node and diffuse dermal bed flow on the entire upper limb up to two hours of the TC99 injection. Prior, we like to use a Doppler ultrasound to evaluate the, the donor side lymph node basin. And in our experience, the cemento and the groin had the most um, a large number of the lymph node available for transfer and greater than supraclavicular. Here's an example of vascularized groin, groin lymph node transfer to the wrist. As you can see, the, the flat design below the inguinal ligament, that's the most uh, superficial uh, inguinal ligament lo location they can divide into two groups of the lymph node. In my early practice, I like to harvest as much lymph node as possible to maximize the, the lymphatic drainage function. And we transfer the lymph node to the distal uh, dorsal wrist and hook up the, the radial artery, uh, radi artery dorsal branch and cephalic band. As you can see, initially the flare was a little bit bulky and uh, we can devise it uh, one year after. Here is a, a picture of follow-up, post of uh, seven months, and the reduction rate was 44% uh, available, 27% below able. No post of compression government required immediate after surgery. And there's a, 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 a longer follow-up, the reduction rate continued improved to 55%. 
Another case of vascular growing lymph node transfer for grade four lymphedema. And here's a flap design and the flap uh, close to the common femoral artery. And we like to use the medial branch of the uh, directory from common femoral vessels. And the, the, here you can see the flap design harvest and, and pedicle division and transfer to the recipient side on the dorsal wrist. As you can see, the radial artery dorsal branch and also the uh, cervical band. Buffer, excuse me, how can I control my mouse? I cannot control it. Um, we actually can see your mouse. I can see the pointer. You, you can't see it? I, I, I can't. Ah, um, I'm not quite sure because we can definitely see your mouse. Um, any Mac people out there who may have an idea? Do you want to go uh, exit full screen and go back in and see if that helps? No, no, I can see it. Uh, okay. Sorry, I cannot see my mouse. I don't know how to control it. Uh, so I cannot use a point to point out. Okay. And here you can see the, the excuse me, let me try one more time to. Okay. And here you can see the pre-op uh, uh, picture and patient have several uh, episodes of arthritis and post of four months and post of four years, the reduction rate was 60% about elbow. And at 11 years of follow-up, the patient does, didn't need any compression garment. The reduction rate continues improve up to 70%. And, and then we, after a couple of years of uh, uh, experience, we moved to some mental different flap because the flap is much thinner than the growing and with a, um, a similar quantity of the lymphano, but have a better, a bigger vessel of the pedicle. We did a cut dissection of some mental lymphano flap at UT Southwestern with uh, the collaboration with uh, Michael Sincere and also at the Duke University with uh, Michael Zen. And therefore we come up to this uh, uh, result that the submental lymphano flap have a bunch of uh, quantity of the lymphano and is reliable with the, the submental artery and, and original from the facial uh, artery. And here you can see after lattice injection and the pedicle uh, was beautiful to nourish a group of the lymphano and the skin pedal usually reliable with the average for cutaneous perforator to the skin. So we can harvest the skin lymph node with the bigger vessel of the pedicle. We further uh, did a, a MRI study to mapping the number of the lymph node. And here you can see the most lymph node located at the center a two quarter if, uh, from the um, midnight to the mandibular angle. And also uh, if you made a, a radius, a, about two centimeters around the anterior border of the submandibular gland, there's the most uh, different node located. And this is study to help you to design the submental lymphano flap and to catch most uh, uh, most lymphano available on this uh, zone one area. For the recipient vessel, you can transfer to anywhere you want to. And for my practice, I'd like to transfer the distal uh, the spin side, usually the dorsal uh, wrist. And if the patient concerned about cosmesis, maybe you can choose the, the ala side, the volar side. And in this case, we choose the volar side and close to the ala artery and the vein. And in trial, we found the ala uh, vein is too small or the basic, basic vein was too small. So uh, as here, you can see the dead low corner and the vessel, uh, facial vessel is, was a very big, about five millimeter. And uh, we have a cephalic vein transposition. And you can see the size discrepancy in this case. But the cause was um, an eventual 
for. And here you can see the wound closer with the delayed primary retention suture to avoid any compression to the pedicle vein. That's a pre-op picture. Post of three months, the reduction rate was around 10%. Post of 33 months, the reduction rate up to 95% above airborne, 80% below airborne. Another case pre-op and post of three months. Post of 30 months, the reduction rate was around 50% above and below elbow. The donor side uh, was minimal in the cemental area. Most patients, they don't uh, pay attention to the inconspicuous scar. And some uh, elder patient or obese patient, they even asked to revise the contrary rate of uh, redundant skin and fat. And how, it, how, the, how does the vascularized lymph node work for lymphatic drainage? And we, in 2009, we proposed this uh, uh, lymph pump mechanism via natural lymph venous channel and followed by catchment effect and gravity effect. This cartoon can help you understand at the mechanism at the anastomosis of the pedicle. Um, there's a pressure gradient, the lymph nodes start to absorb the lymph drainage into the vein via the natural connection and followed by catchment effect and gravity effect. So the lymph node can continue to drainage the lymph into the venous system. And I'd like to share some evidence of uh, the mechanism of vascular lymph node transfer. And here is the, uh, vest, uh, the vascular cemental lymph node flap being dissected with the pedicle steer in continuity. As you can see, the, the white loop is uh, um, the marginal mandibular nerve well preserved, and the red loop is a facial artery. The, the blue loop is uh, a facial vein, and the yellow uh, arrows uh, were the, the sizable lymph node was uh, um, observed. And we were lucky to collect some lymph from the recipient side, uh, a preparation on the leg. And when we put into a flask, and, and then you can see we added some endocyanin green. And we put this flask a little bit lower in the neck. And then we press the cemental lymph node on top of this flask uh, with the lymph uh, with the ICG. After 10 minutes, and you can see the, the pedicle got fluorescence. And, and, and this, air, this uh, location is actually upper than the flask uh, in the lymph. So this, it was definitely the natural uh, force uh, within this uh, uh, flap. They allow the, the lymph node to absorb the lymph with the ICG drainage to this uh, pedicle vein. You can see carefully that the, the pedicle vein got fluorescent. So, um, until uh, after a couple of years of uh, research, we, uh, we finally proved that um, the lymphano, vascular lymphano can absorb the limb turning into the pedicle vein. So uh, we, we consider the lymphano uh, with this picture uh, after a couple of years of experience. And the lymphano have uh, efferent duct and efferent duct. They also have an arterial inflow and venous outflow. And there is a connection between this uh, uh, venous system and the lymphatic system inside this uh, lymph node flap. So majority of the lymph were drained uh, out via the efferent duct, but also they can drain it out via the, the venous system through the lymph node. We compare the quality of life after lymph transfer in the upper lymph edema 
and follow up at uh, 12 months. As you can see, the circumference uh, significantly improved from 60% and to down to 6.7%. And the overall quality of life using lymphoedema specific uh, uh, question. And as you can see, the overall quality of life improved from 2.2 up to 7.4 at one year follow up. We further did a, a study. Uh, compare two, 285 patients and 126 in upper limb, 159 in lower limb. And here you can see the basic uh, uh, demographics. We divide the patient using the lymphocytography and from the normal lymphatic drainage to obstruction and total obstruction. For the partial attraction and total attraction, we look at the plasma lymph node. If they present plasma lymph node uh, partially, we call it partial attraction. If no plasma lymph node available, we, talk, we call total attraction. Then we look at the lymph node vessels and, and also the thermal backflow. If they present lymph node vessels, and usually we present at the partial attraction, and and uh, we call it from P1, P2 to P3. And after P2, there's no uh, lymphatic vessel uh, with a distal or lo localized uh, thermal backflow. If they have diffused uh, thermal backflow, we call P3. And for total attraction also, if a local, localized thermal backflow, we call T4. And total uh, entire limb attraction, we call T5. If we inject TC99, there's no flow moving after two hours. We, uh, even uh, more severe, we call T6. We compare the um, Taiwan lymphocytography staging system to uh, several ob objective objects, such as uh, symptom duration. They have a significantly strong positive correlation and also the episode cellulitis versus the lymphocytography staging. And for the CT, uh, for the circumferential difference and also CT volumetric difference, and they are also significantly positive relative to the Taiwan lymphocytography staging system. Then we compare uh, all these patient group into two parts. One is a surgical group, one is a two a non surgical group. And we look at the lymphocytography and treatment option. Um, the treatment, uh, surgical treatment, including lymphovenous anastomosis or vascular lymph node transfer. 26 in, underwent LOVA and 116 underwent viral NT with the average follow up of 29 months. For the non surgical group, we have also um, followed up around 29 months. And here we found the surgical group have a significant improve, improvement of circumferential difference from pre treatment 24% um, and improve up to 15%. For the non surgical group, the circumference differential difference even got worse from 29% to 31%. When we compare the episodes of cellulitis for the surgical group, they uh, have a significant improvement from pretreatment 2.1 times per year uh, to post-treatment 0.8 times per year. For the non-surgical treatment, uh, even got worse from 2.5, um, increase to 3.5 per, times per year. Here is the algorithm we treat uh, breast cancer related lymphedema. First of all, we like to have a, a prevention um, either uh, through the education and or some recently we have a, a new uh, immediate lymphatic reconstruction. And we also look at any contraindication for surgery, LVA or lymph node transfer. If, if uh, um, the contraindication, we advise patient to receive a physical therapy or and the compression garments. If no contraindication, we like to prescribe TC99 lymphocytography and also for uh, endocyanin green lymphography. 
If the symptom more than five years, probably we can do lymphocytography first. Then we divide the patient into partial attraction or total attraction. If partial attraction, we can may, uh, suggest a LBA or physical therapy. If uh, the, the, no uh, lymphatic vessel available, patent lymphatic vessel available, we can suggest a lymph node transfer directory. If a total attraction, we also suggest lymph node transfer directory. And if and then we go to the LBA, if a patient um, uh, is an indicator, we can can do LBA for, for the patient, it's usually the mild patient at early stage. If they are um, LBA not adequate response, then we can proceed to a lymph node transfer. If patient um, more concerned about cosmesis, we can transfer lymph node to elbow or vertebral side. If patient concerned more functional recovery, we can transfer the lymph node to the dorsal wrist. Then usually we need a, a, a flare revision for better cosmesis. So uh, in conclusion of this part, we reported the first uh, study of vascular growing lymph node transfer to the wrist with a reliable functional recovery for upper lymph edema. And we invent the vascular cemental lymph node flare transfer for the upper and the lower lymph edema. We propose the pump mechanism of vascular lymph node for the drainage of the lymph. And lymph was the drainage was from the transfer lymph node to the venous system. And we found out the longer follow-up, the better functional recovery and quality of life post-vascular lymph node transfer. And vascular lymph node provides statistically great improvement than LOVA and CDT in breast cancer related lymphedema. And we also find the surgical group have statistically significant improvement in circumferential difference episodes of cellulitis than non-surgical group in unilateral extremity lymphedema. This is my first part. Um, and in question, I probably have a full part for you today. Um, let's, uh, let's go on to the other parts and then we'll leave all the questions till the end. Okay. And the second part is an intra-abdominal chiral venous bypass treated little peritoneal lymph angiomatosis. And here's a picture that's showing um, there's a patient came to me with a femoral bone fracture after um, uh, internal vasection. And when we show the, see the sort of uh, X-ray, there's a damage of a uh, femoral bone, iliac bone, hip joint, and even the sacrum. And for the MI, you can see uh, a lot of soft tissue uh, deformity in the, in the hip, uh, hip joint area in, and involved to the pelvis. The retro peritoneal lymphangiomatosis involves aberrant proliferation of lymphatic vessel in the retro peritoneal space. Complications include chylus ascites, chylus sorus, and chylus leakage out or cutaneous fistula, fistula. Patient may have a nutrition balance and, and also low limb lymphedema. The prior imaging study include CTA to do out the vascular region and lymphocytography to, uh, to diagnose the com concomitant low limb lymphedema, MI to evaluate the extra vaccination uh, in the uh, soft tissue uh, in the abdomen. The single photon emission computer tomography SPET can precise uh, uh, evaluate the disease extent and also the accumulated uh, tracer. Here's the MI showing diffuse uh, extrabustation of the uh, uh, cultural median in the abdomen and also the subtissue or the left hip. The space also show left side have the essence of the growing lymph node and the intra, intra abdominal pelvic uh, lymph node, uh, such as the iliac external uh, iliac internal iliac lymph node and sometimes they can also trace to the para aortic lymph node. Between 2012 to, 
and 2018, we have six of seven, uh, we had a total of seven patients under when uh, this study, and six of seven patients with a mean age of 30 years with a positive SPED uh, MI finding. And we have the patient under when exploratory laparotomy. And here's the case that show and after the laparotomy, and we found the retroperitoneum have uh, accumulated quite a significant amount of the ascites. And the red loop show um, there's a ovarian vein. And here you can see the, the white loop showing the ascites, the chylus ascites. And uh, uh, the, the green, green arrow showing the ureter, left side ureter. So we cut down the ovarian vein more distally and rotate to uh, the plasma, and we find out um, uh, area that have continued to have the chylus ascites leak out. So we made a hole on the retroperitoneal space, and then um, in the future the hole is around uh, four millimeter in diameter, and we shoot the ovarian vent to this uh, uh, created uh, hole of the retroperitoneal space and use a site when anastomosis technique. And after the anastomosis, you can see the, the, the chyle the drainage into the ovarian vein, and the surrounding area become more dry after the anastomosis. Here is a picture before the abdominal wall closure. The blue line is a dead ovarian vein, and, and you can see the ureter uh, close to uh, uh, 12 o'clock, and the anastomosis uh, the, with the uh, uh, yellow uh, arrow, and uh, you can see the lymphangiomatosis, the little planetary space is much dry after the anastomosis. And here you can see the patent kind of venous bypass uh, at the two months of follow-up CT and geography, uh, as you can see in the yellow arrow. The patient also underwent hip articulation. So after the, uh, the surgery of the hip articulation and chylovenous bypass, the patient uh, are, were able to uh, mobile to get out of the bed and also have a uh, complete get rid of the chylus ascites. This is another case that came to me for loading lymphedema. And we have lymphocytography diagnosis that's a T5. As you can see, the that loading with a total thermal bedflow and SM of the growing lymph node. But for the uh, in, intrapelvic lymph node still presented. As the, uh, you can see, the dye also uh, go up to the intra-abdominal area. Here you can see the, the picture of the C that uh, the uh, quite um, significant amount of the chylus ascites. And after two chylovenous bypass uh, at the uh, uh, yellow arrows and, and uh, all the area being dry, the chylus, the chyle become drainage into the ovarian vein. And the, Right side E picture, you can see after injection of endocyline green to the more distal part of the retroperitoneal space. And we can see the, the ovarian vein gaffrorescent. So this uh, is a uh, direct evidence showing that um, the, the chyle leakage from retroperitoneal space, they can drainage to the ovarian vein completely. Here's a picture of pre-op, post of two weeks and post of 11 months. As you can see, the upper side has in significant improvement and the lower, limb, uh, lower leg a little bit swelling than before. But there's a, um, before the surgery, patient were uh, compliant to the compression garment. But after surgery, no compression garment. And this patient uh, were able to tolerate uh, all the uh, activity without compression garment, and even 
and gave a, a childbirth. And as a result, we have um, uh, the diagnosis uh, sensitivity was, was uh, 86%, and all six color bypass bypasses were patent. And one patient had a complication of jejunum perversion at the time of the uh, exploration laparotomy. And anastomosis cytosombosis was also repaired uh, uh, where, uh, at a jejunum resection and uh, repair. And cis vascular lymph node at the same time in five patients uh, were all survived. At 12 months of follow up, mean circumferential difference significantly improved by 4.2 centimeter. The episode severity is also significantly decreased. The quality of life also improved from 3.4 to 5.7 at 12 months of follow up. All patients were able to tolerate regular diet by six months without recurrence of chiral ascites. And five or six patients were able to complete uh, abundant the compression garment. The mechanism of chiral venous bypass is likely to through shunting the chiral directly back to the venous circulation. That's a uh, mimic the physiology of uh, um, circulation of the lymph. And it can prevent the extraluminal flow displacement and circumvent the ascites infection protein loss and the particular leakage of its extremity. The diagnosis of retro peritoneal lymph angiomatosis with the dolin lymph edema was challenging. The color venous bypass required multidisciplinary co coordination for operationally fear exposure and microscope anastomosis with a limited recipient vessel in an atypical anastomosis site. The color venous bypass was effective to treat little peritoneal lymph angiomatosis with chylus ascites. Then there's another part. Um, we just uh, have uh, this paper uh, published in uh, a June issue of PIS. This uh, volumetric difference of suprafascia and subfascia compartments in secondary unilateral rolling lymph, lymph edema. This study was a collaborated with uh, uh, Stuart Wang at, uh, and Paul Sedona at the University of Michigan. That's a unilateral loading lymph edema. As you can see, there's a total obstruction on the right loading on lymphocytography. The purpose of this study was to investigate the volumetric differences in suprafascia and subfascia compartments between lymphoedematous and unaffected lower limbs. Between 2011 to 2017, 32 female patients with secondary lymphoedema was, were included in this uh, study. The severity of lymphoedema was based on chance lymphoedema grading system and Taiwan lymphocytography stating system. And, and the volume of the superfascia subfascia component of above knee and below knee were calculated with the Osiris XMD at the hand met the region of interest on CT of bilateral loading. Then we calculate the volumetric difference and the volumetric ratio of, of the each compartments and compare within 32 patients. So this is a picture of the region of the uh, interest of the deep fascia. So we use a hand mat to uh, have this uh, um, of the uh, region of interest on the red dot land. The, the gray surface band was uh, uh, located outside of the deep fascia and also the laser surface band. And we compare from the extreme to the uh, knee joint, and then, then there's a about elbow, about knee, and then from knee joint to the, the angle joint, there's a below knee. And then we, uh, we can compare um, 
uh, uh, for the compartments. This uh, uh, summary of the violent and violent difference and a different violent difference ratio in 32 patients. For the uh, lymphoedematous lymph, the total volume was uh, 9,600. 9, For the unaffected lymph, there's a 6,900 uh, uh, ml. And for the volumetric difference, there's a 2,097. And as you can see, the saphasia have a, a volumetric difference of about 1,800. And there's the superfascia 1,800, subfascia 200. For the volume, volumetric difference ratio, there's a 56% in the subfascia, superfascia component, and 44.7 on the subfascia component. The total volume, the volumetric difference ratio around 30%. And there's a further, we divide into the above knee and below knee. And here you can see the subfascia uh, have a, um, the superfascia have a more violent difference around uh, 1,000 cc. Uh, and for the subfascia, there's a 183 cc. The total is a 1,200 cc above knee. For the below knee uh, comp uh, part, there's a 761 cc of superfascia. And, and 50 cc on the subfascia and total 819 cc below knee. And this uh, um, picture is showing how the, uh, how the volumetric difference of the superfascia and subfascia. The most uh, uh, violent increase in the lymphoedematous limb will contribute by the Superfascia component, as you can see the red col column in this picture, and the blue color is a subfascia component. And most time they also increase in the total of violence. Then we compare the above knee, there's a, a using orange color, and the below knee uh, using uh, red color, as you can see. Uh, most patients they also have a um, volume difference in the in the above knee area, and the subfascia component was increased in eighty eight percent of the patient, and in this picture. So we also compare the chance different demand gradient to the volume. A difference in this study. There's a grade one, two, three, four patient as an example. For the grade one, the, the violent difference in average, the, the in, in median is a 1,000 1, cc. For the grade two, there's a 1,800 cc. For the grade three, is a 2,400 cc. For the grade four, there's a 4,100 4, cc in average to 2,000 cc. And this picture uh, is easy to understand. There's a grade one, two, three, they have different uh, volum volumetric difference. So, and also the volume difference ratio also significantly different between grade one and grade four and grade two and grade four. And the, the volume difference between four trans lymphedema gradient was statistically significant. So means that um, the chance divide gradient using circumferential difference is compatible with the volumetric difference. So we can uh, continue to use the chance divide gradient simply use the circumferential difference measurement. And if you want to accurate, you can use a uh, um, CT volumetric difference and they are strongly correlated. And what is the meaning of um, um, impact of this study? As you can see, the subfascia uh, component also increased uh, in the lymphedema patient. So if we only treat the, sub the superfascia component, means the, the adipose tissue layer, 
you cannot completely treat the pa patient with a lymphoid edema. So you have to open up the deep fascia and also treat uh, not only just the superfascia component, also the subfascia component. So I, it changed my practice when I uh, transfer the lymph node to the distal recipients. I, I usually open up the deep fascia to allow the superfascia component connect to the subfascia component. If we only do liposuction alone, you can decrease the suprafascia uh, compartment, but you cannot treat uh, the subfascia compartment. So uh, LVA and liposuction and all the procedure only deal with the suprafascia compartment and not completely cure the lymphoedema patient. So in conclusion, the CT volumetric measurement was the first time used in the lymphoedematous lift, including superfascia and subfascia components. The volumetric difference in the lymphoedematous limb was statistically greater than the unaffected limb, including both superfascia and subfascia component. The volumetric difference were compatible with the trans edema grading system as a, a, a good indicator of unilateral extremity lymphoedema. And the last part is that the impact of arterial ischemia or venous occlusion and vascularized growing lymph node in a red model. The critical, critical ischemia time of the vascular lymph node transfer was five hours in our uh, public previous uh, study. However, the venous congestion is still more frequently seen in the clinical setting in vascular lymph node transfer. It seems to be more detrimental than arterial ischemia. So the goal of this study was to see the effect of the arterial ischemia and minus occlusion on vascular lymph node transfer. We conduct this study uh, using a Lewis rate uh, with 400 to 600 and equal to seven per each group. And we have a four group in arterial ischemia time from one hour ischemia, three hours, four hours, and five hours ischemia. And the second group was a venous um, occlusion with a one hour, three hour, four hours, five hours of venous occlusion. The procedure including dissection of bilateral pedicle growing lymph node, and then we have a lesser dopa to assess the pre crumb and crumb and at the crumb release of one hour, two hours. And then we have a, a ICG, ICG lymphography and also look at the latent time, excuse me. And then we have lesser dopa to look at the perfusion at the one hour deperfusion, two hour deperfusion. And we have analysis of the HE stand, tuna stand, and GSH stand, SA. This is arterial uh, ischemia uh, group of picture. And the first law uh, were crumb picture, and, and R2 means uh, the perfusion two hours. So the A1 is ischemia, arterial ischemia one hour, A3 three hours, A4 four hours, A5 five hours. As you can see, after five hours ischemia and the reperfusion, most of the, the growing lymph node were able to return almost normal color in two hours reperfusion. And for venous occlusion, then uh, after crumb up to five hours and reperfusion for for two hours, as you can see, at before four hours, B1, B3, B4 group they are able to return to normal color. But however, the V5 group, they are not able to completely return to the normal color. Still a little bit congestion inside of red, uh, as you can see in the yellow arrow. Here's the lesser dopra from matching. Um, here on um, the A1, B, B1 at the same rate, and A3, B3, A4, B4, A5, B5. And we have first law is a pre-crumb. As you can see 
if the the, the color become more red, there's a more uh, better perfusion. And then after crumb, as you can see, the 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 flag become more a uh, blue color change. And R zero means uh, immediate uh, after reperfusion. R one means uh, one hour reperfusion and two hours reperfusion. And then you you can see at the four hours the the venous occlusion group they still have the, some uh, blue color in the left side and you, at the five hours they're more uh, severe and for the arterial uh, group they after two hours of reperfusion they usually can return to normal so these are uh, uh, the table that you can easy to understand after uh, five hours arterial uh, uh, ischemia the perfusion can return to almost normal uh, at the 2.0 perfusion unit. For the venous occlusion uh, group, um, the V4 group, they can return to normal perfusion at the 1.5, but at the five hours of, uh, occlusion group, they only are able to return to 0 0.8 compared to pre cram 1.9 they were significantly decreased. As you can see the picture with the green line. So the V5 group at the, the perfusion tool could not return to the normal perfusion. There's an endosanin group with a latent um, period. So uh, again, at, for the arterial group, they are able to uh, return almost normal within uh, 30, 30 seconds. But for the venous occlusion group at the V5 group, and the the latency period had to up to uh, 152 seconds. There, there were significant uh, differences with compared to other group. That you actually then uh, we can see the congestion uh, in become severe in the venous occlusion group at the uh, V. B4 and B5 group. For the tunnel assay, they can, you can see the significantly uh, text uh, increase in the, as the ischemia time or occlusion time increase in the A5, B, uh, A4, and B, B4, B5 group. And we also look at the histology change of the diphenol in the medulla and the, also the cortex. The arterial group, they have nothing changing in the cortex uh, um, part and mild to moderate change congestion in the medulla part. For the venous occlusion group in the medulla part, they are severe, severe uh, change and, and also can observe uh, the cortex change at the B3 to B5 group. And we look at the glutathione that for the uh, cell viability, as you can see the arterial group, they, they have decreased in the uh, A4 group, but they can return at the A5 group. But for the venous occlusion group, uh, after the V5 group, they can increase the viability, but five hours they decrease the viability. So we put all this together with the uh, uh, glutathione concentra uh, the concentration and also the ICG latency period, we found, found out the arterial group in generally um, the insult of the arterial ischemia at four, four hours and five hours, they have some insult, but they still can, uh, the cell can still viable and they can return almost normal or uh, function. But the for the venous occlusion group, Combine this a uh, couple of study that uh, we found out for the four hours of venous occlusion group, they have significantly decreased the cell viability and the function of the uh, lymph node. So venous congestion was more frequently happened in the clinical setting, and venous, con venous congestion seems more detrimental than arterial ischemia. So when the venous congestion develops, the first service procedures should be promptly performed within four hours of 
photo occlusion or the venous drainage. We can use a stitch reducing keep, pin, keep breathing or anticoagulant uh, to allow more time for the cell VG procedure. To the best of our knowledge, this was the, the first study to demonstrate the different deterioration of effect of the artery and the venous occlusion on the function and viability of the vascular lymph node transfer. The critical venous occlusion time for vascularized lymph node was four hours, as detected by Doppler from ICG fluorescent lymphography and histology analyst. Thank you for your attention. Mingwei, thank you so much for uh, this incredible talk. You know, I, I've heard you give a lot of talks, but every time you give a talk, there's something new, um, <laughs> some new data, some new science. So c congratulations for always pushing forward and always um, trying to innovate and think of new ways of uh, discovering more information uh, on lymphedema. Uh, so, I uh, just wanted to uh, make that comment so so that it's uh, it's obvious that we appreciate it and we recognize it. Um, before I ask the questions that I have, uh, one of my partners, Dr. Walter Lin, has a question. Walter, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Professor Chang. It was a, a great talk as always. I, I really love how you're always coming up with new ideas. Um, I think your idea about opening the deep fascia um, is a really good one, and and we we did that. Uh, uh, after we visited you, and it, and it worked very well with our, our lymph node flap. What do you think um, we should do that for LVA also, um, in order to allow the supra and subfascial fluid to um, um, to drain better? Would that, do you think that would work? work? Ideally, if you can have put the LVA on, on the deep fascia, that would be perfect. But how can you do the LVA on the deep, below the deep fascia? You have to open up the deep fascia and you have to find the vein and also the patent lymphatic duct. But so far, I don't see any report or paper say you can find the, the lymphatic vessel below the, the deep fascia in the, in the muscle component. We know there's a lymph in the muscle component. So you have to drain into the lymph in the muscle component. Otherwise, you cannot really cure the patient. So ideally, I think it's good to have an LVA down to the deep fascia. Mm. Okay. Great. Um, so a, a, a couple of uh, questions, Mingwei. Um, yeah. One of them is on uh, what your thoughts are on the role of immediate lymphatic reconstruction. Um, both in terms of uh, lymphatic venous bypass, such as the lympha procedure, uh, and also um, in, in the setting of uh, immediate lymph node transfer. Um, Joe Diane gave us a talk and he showed us a series of immediate um, lymph node flaps uh, when the patient has undergone a lymphadenectomy. Do you have any experience in that and what are your thoughts on either that or performing a lympha type immediate bypass? I think it's a great idea to have an immediate lymphatic reconstruction after um, acid development dissection. Um, so far, there's a couple of reporters uh, say they had promising results. Um, but the question is um, how can the lymph venous bypass immediate LOVA can tolerate the pulse of radiation? Um, I, they had to have, a, a, I think they have had more objective evaluation if the, the LOVA can tolerate positive radiation and, <clears throat> and even the, the scarring. <clears throat> Otherwise, I, I have personal have a, a big couple of cases, I even have a, a, a Drew Singer came here uh, for the lab surgery demonstration and the patient actually uh, went very well so far but the observation of the, uh, the result outcome of the immediate LOVA is still uh, questionable. So uh, many surgeons such as um, my friend David Chen, they still 
a little bit hesitated to do so because we still worry about the uh, pulse of radiation. The pulse of radiation um, may uh, damage everything, as you may know, and after the the severe scarring. And they usually use the uh, the compressive method to like uh, autopus to put the lymphatic duct into a vein. So the long-term result for this uh, um, compressive technique is still uh, not not been uh, worldwide uh, used uh, at other center. So there's uh, two concerns I have had. Um, but I, I certainly like to do more uh, immediate uh, divided deconstruction using LVA and to see the outcome mm -hmm. personally. But the long term results need more investigation. Right, great. Um, the next question I had was um, regarding the physiology of the venous system of, of the lymphatic flap. Um, having visited you and, and having operated with you, I know that you like to repair your flap vein in a flow-through fashion uh, so that uh, you've reconstituted the cephalic vein flow across the facial vein of the submental flap. And this makes sense because the um, submental flap by itself is a pretty low flow flap. And so the flow across the vein is probably not that great, but by uh, performing a flow through with a cephalic, you increase that flow and potentially decrease the uh, the the chance of um, you know venous congestion or even clotting in the long term. I also know that you perform regular um, studies on patients postoperatively, even many months out, to look at any stenosis that there might be from scar formation around the veins. Um, would you mind commenting on your philosophy behind that and what your protocol is with the timing of the post-op uh, surveillance of the veins of these flaps? Uh, initially, we think of the function related to the number of the lymph nodes being transferred. And we have did this study to compare two lymph nodes versus a greater than two lymph nodes. So we found out the more lymph node you transfer, the fun better function recovery can be observed. But we also found some group of patients they have uh, initially have very good response after lymph node transfer uh, within a couple of months. But after uh, six months, they are a little bit down here, and then sometimes they up and down. But after one year, they have better outcome. So we found out the, the we did a, a CT angiography or ultrasound DOPA to map in the vessel being transferred. And especially the CT angiography, more sensitive, they are able to detect the particle artery in the vein. Usually artery are uh, pattern all the time. And, but the vein, some, many times they got a, a little bit scarring, and sometimes they got even a very small, a small diameter uh, lumen uh, with a severe external occlusion. Therefore, I start to uh, send the patient back for revision to check the pedicle. And we find out the pedicle has been severe scarring, and even sometimes even occlusion. We cannot dissect the entire pedicle out. So we need to cut a, a segment of the uh, scarring vein and reconnect the pedicle from cephalic vein to more, more uh, plasma uh, facial vein. But after this kind of revision, the patient can return to better uh, function. So the function of transfer lymph node related to limp, number lymph node and also the pedicle vein, and because usually artery they are pattern. So uh, we like to do CT and geography to uh, surveillance the the outcome, especially the pedicle vein. If there any occlusion, uh, we would like to uh, uh, explore it. And, and release the scarring and all, sometimes need to re-anastomose it with, with the vein graft. Mm -hmm. so, so you've noticed a correlation then with the function of the flap long-term and compression yes. of the vein. Got yes. It. Yeah. So that's very different than uh, other types of flaps where um, over time there is collateral, uh, collateralization of a new growth of veins uh, but in a lymphatic flap, I guess the theory is that you still rely on the flap vein for drainage of the lymphatic um, uh, fluid. Is that correct? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Because the arterial flow and then venous outflow, there's a pressure gradient. So you need a, pre a pressure gradient to allow they have good uh, good function of the flow. Mm -hmm. Then the different law uh, sit besides the uh, the this uh, pressure gradient, especially the practical band, then allow to absorb the lymph drainage to the band. If a band been occluded, you can observe the transfer flap become more bulky and even a little bit congestion and become very, very big because the lymph node absorb the lymph. But if the outflow of the particle been a partial obstruction, they, they cannot drain it out. And the artery keep uh, pumping blood into this flap and also absorb the lymph. So the transfer flap will become very, very bulky. So at this time, is the outflow of the particle vein being obstructed. So we need to go back to uh, release it, to repair it for the anastomosis. If we don't do it, the functional of lymph node become uh, being uh, worse or impaired. Right. That, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, you, I've seen the video that you sh show of the submental flap placed in the dish of ICG. And in mm -hmm. as little as 10 minutes, uh, it's able to uh, basically um, absorb the ICG and drain it through the vein. Um, so the question is, and this is more of a hypothetical or theoretical one, what do you think the mechanism is of the flap being able to so quickly within 10 minutes being able to internalize that liquid? Because we usually think about these flaps taking a while for the lymphatic channels to, to, to kind of grow. Um, and incorporated to the surrounding tissues. What do you think the mechanism of this is that, that works uh, so quickly? The mechanism, this is not through the neo-lymphangiogenesis. People will think lymphangiogenesis is more important uh, to allow the lymph coming to this uh, flat, uh, lymph node. But in my opinion, there's a natural lymphatic venous connection. And the different node made as the negative suction pump machine. So they are uh, able to uh, absorb the protein rich fluid. They can and absorb into this flap. Actually, we did an animal study and showing that if the, the, the water uh, contain no albumin, there's a, the, the absorption become uh, much less. If the the water normal setting contain uh, five percent, even ten percent of the albumin, high concentration of protein, they are able to absorb the 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 fluid uh, quickly and uh, and faster, and also largely. So um, the lymph has a protein rich and about three point five um, the density the density. So um, they are able to allow the lymph node to absorb and drainage uh, into the venous system. So it's a natural um, uh, absorption mechanism, not, not by other lymphangiogenesis. Mm -hmm. And if we inject uh, the ICG to the flap, it's much fast. Um, I, I remember that uh, uh, about six minutes, they are able to absorb the, to see the fluorescence on the pedicle after injection to the flap edge. But we, if we don't inject, we as a put the flat on the flask, it, it took about 10 minutes. Got it. Great. Um, so that those are um, all the questions I have. Any questions from the audience, feel free to turn your mic on and ask if you have any questions. All right, well, looks like uh, it looks like everyone has really enjoyed your talk and has been um, satisfied with the amount of information given. Mingwei, I wanted to thank you again for thank you. Um, taking the time on a Saturday morning uh, to uh, share your wisdom and your experience with us. And I think one of the um, silver linings of the coronavirus pandemic and shutdown has been that in many ways, information has become more democratized. And it used to be that um, people would have to fly to Changgung to hear your lecture or, or learn from you or fly to a conference and have to pay the registration and, and learn. But now through the generosity of our speakers um, and our friends and our colleagues, 
uh, we're able to get the same information conveyed across the world um, and have everyone from medical students all the way through attending surgeons uh, benefit from that. So thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. It's my great honor to share my experience. I'm very happy to see you and Dr. Banki and, and Walter and everyone here. Thank you so much. Great. It's great to see you and I hope to see you in person soon. Yeah, yeah, stay now, one healthy thing, and stay. Perfect, one thing I wanna show, um, I we're gonna post the, um, let me sh share my screen here with you. We're gonna sh uh, post the remaining schedule of uh, the lectures coming up um, to make it easy for folks to keep uh, keep track. And if you go to my partner Rudy Buntik's website, um, later tonight we'll uh, post the Google Sheet that has all the information on uh, the lectures as well as the GoToMeeting links uh, to access them. And this is uh, www.microsurgeon.org slash lectures. All the lectures will also be posted on the same website uh, shortly. Um, and so we'll we'll get that information out to everyone again. On Monday, we have two additional fantastic lectures. Um, Dr. Alain Gilbert from Paris uh, will be discussing um, his um, extensive experience in obst obstetric brachial plexus palsy. Um, and Monday afternoon, our time, Dr. Jim Higgins from the Curtis National Hand Center will be discussing the refinements in microsurgical reconstruction of the upper limb. Um, so with that, again, thanks everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you again, P Professor Cheng, for joining us and hope to see you again soon. Take Thank care, you. everybody. Have a nice Thank you. Good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.